So, um, good evening, everybody. So, uh, my name is Darren, and uh, so welcome to this, our second webinar of uh, 2021. And just to kick things off, I've got a few slides just to uh, introduce our, our, uh, uh, the webinar, and then we'll move on to two presentations and a, ser a group Q&A as well. So just on the questions as we go through the presentations, if you send them through to me uh, via the chat function or question function um, in, in the software, I will pick them up and group them together uh, into some questions at the end. So as we go through, just drop the questions through and I will uh, pick them up at the end and group them together. And, and we've got two excellent, excellent presentations today. So first of all, we've got uh, AJ. Uh, and he will introduce himself as part of his presentation and Mike as well. So a little bit of housekeeping to start things off. Um, first of all, a big thank you. So a big thank you to our two presenters. As we all know, it takes, always takes time to prepare these presentations. So a big thank you to them, to our attendees. Um, questions I've mentioned, uh, just drop them through as we go along. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, so uh, a few days afterwards, normally it's, it's released and you should um, automatically get a link to that. If you don't get a link to the recording, let's say after a week or so, let me know and we, we will have a look at that. And then lastly, um, sometimes uh, people request certificates of attendance maybe as part of their uh, CPD points for your various professional institutes. If you want one of those, just drop me a message on LinkedIn and I will get, through, uh, get that through to you over the next couple of days as well. So um, just a little bit of uh, uh, an introduction to the IRM, the Institute of Risk Management for those um, who aren't aware. Um, so in terms of a, as a professional body, it represents um, 8,000 members uh, worldwide, and, and, and it is effectively the, the leading professional body for risk management globally. Uh, you'll see up on the right-hand side, over the years, the IRM has developed a range of qualifications, both uh, general and specialist, and you'll see some of the examples. There are many, other, many on the website, but you'll just see some of the examples down in the bottom right hand corner and i do realize that i think it's in the next three four five days is the cutoff for registering for the december exams so if you are interested have a little look and uh, if you want to register please do so in the next few days as well as well and again if you have any queries problems feel free to get in touch and, and either if i cannot answer the the question I will uh, find somebody from the IRM to answer it for you. So a little bit about us, uh, who are we? So uh, the, the Institute of Risk Management has a number of either special interest groups or regional groups. So we're a regional group covering the kingdoms of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And, and as you can see on the slide, I won't go through it, you know, certain keywords, we're here to support the risk management community. That doesn't matter if you are a risk professional or even just somebody interested in risk management, provide networking opportunities, just generally as well to raise awareness of both the IRM and the value of risk management. So that's our, our purpose. And, and in terms of how we do that, one of the ways we do that is through our events. And we try to run four events a year. We have done so for the last, since 2019. This year, we're, we're uh, stretching ourselves a little bit. We'll try to squeeze five in. And um, so just watch out for that. So, uh, so July could be early August, depending on, I have to check when it is, September and December. So we'll aim for five as a minimum we will do four. And as well, we, for those who are regular attendees, we're so lucky to have such a breadth and depth of presenters. So if you're interested in being a presenter, let me know. You can, you can present on your own. You can present jointly with a colleague. You can present for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Just if you're interested at all, let me know and we can, we can have a chat about yourself, topic, and, and we'll try to schedule you in over the coming events as well. Uh, one thing as well, you, you would have seen this um, 
in, in on LinkedIn, uh, publicizing this particular webinar. This year, we've launched a, a survey for the region. You don't have to be a risk professional to complete it. And what we've tried to do is structure the survey around the World Economic Forum uh, short and long-term long risks. And what we want to try and do is see how regionally, what the trends are compared to global trends uh, within the World Economic Forum report. The, the link was in the, um, I, I, everything I send out, I normally put the link on. If you have not filled in the survey, I would really appreciate if you could. And then one of our uh, webinars later in the year, I will present the results um, for that. Next thing, um, as well, for those who remember uh, back in early 2020, we tried to uh, set up uh, an inaugural uh, regional risk management awards and uh, COVID struck, it's, uh, but we need to get that back up and running again. And we're going to try and do it for this year. Um, the purpose of the awards, just again, you see the words, recognition, celebration of both the value of risk management and the expertise of, of the risk professionals in, in, in the region. We have four categories. You can see them on the screen. Uh, the fourth one, I've been asked a few questions about you know, what defines young. Uh, yeah, if you're, if in doubt, apply. I'm, I'm sort of saying, I'm making this up, anything under 30, but, but please send something through. So if you're, um, so if in doubt, try and look down the awards. I would like to think, um, the community, either you nominate yourself, nominate a colleague, a project you're on, a client, a supplier, have a look down and start thinking. Um, also as well, we were very lucky when we tried to set up the first, uh, this the first time, we had a number of uh, excellent organizations who were um, sort of willing to sponsor both the event and uh, some of the awards. When I say the word sponsor, this is simply about um, maybe supporting with one of the, uh, a little trophy or something like that. So it's not like massive amounts of money. If you're interested, if your organization is interested in being associated or sponsoring one of these awards, again, please let me know and, and we can have a chat about that as well. Just a little bit of housekeeping on the awards. Uh, um, these, uh, as I said, this webinar is recorded. So, and I will send these details out um, probably via LinkedIn as well. We're trying to make sure that the activity is uh, based in Saudi Arabia or Bahrain. So you as an individual may live outside. For example, you could be a consultancy live, uh, based in UAE, but if the activity or work is, done, is completed in Saudi Arabia or Bahrain, please submit a, an award. Um, also, uh, we will um, honour the previous nomination. So for this inaugural awards, anything over since 2019, so those who previously submitted nomination, we will honor that. So it's quite a broad range of time. Um, and in terms of the high level timeline in July, uh, we'll push out the details for the uh, arrangements, but you can start thinking about it now. October will be the deadline. And in December at our event in December, we will announce those awards. Um, any queries, questions, just contact me via uh, LinkedIn or, or WhatsApp. So in terms of today, so what are the outcomes? Um, it's about sharing experiences and, and opinion. And, and one of the key things I'll, I'll always emphasize is about diversity of thought. We will not always agree on, on, on some of the things we hear today, some of the questions, but it's here to provoke thought, um, get us to think about things from a, di a different angle, uh, listen to other people's experiences, also, as well, just to widen our network. So we've, two, as I said, two excellent presenters um, today. So please connect with them on LinkedIn. If maybe that you have a follow-up question or query, they will be more than happy to answer it uh, via LinkedIn as well. Cool. So on that note, um, I'm going to try and give the ball to our first uh, presenter, AJ. So, AJ, if you switch on your webcam, and I will try to make you presenter. So, I can see your screen. So, if you want to go to presentation mode, and then once I can see your screen, 
uh, I, I will drop off for you to present. Uh, excellent. I can see on a quick comms check, AJ, do you want to just say something just, just to check? Testing, one, two, three. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. So I'll, I'll drop off and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. All right. So let me just get rid of that. Okay. Well, thank you all, all for attending this session. Um, my name is uh, AJ um, and uh, I am a UK born civil engineer, 27 years of uh, career experience within uh, major construction programs, 15 years in the UK, 12 years in the Middle East. And I do specialize in risk management and uh, have applied it across the entire project life cycle. I'm a certified fellow with the Institute of Risk Management and uh, a certified lead implementer. That means I just know how to audit. Um, a member of the Chartered Management Institute in the UK uh, with an MBA from London, um, starting off uh, in civil engineering. Over the last 12 years, uh, I have successfully implemented risk management practices across the Middle East, uh, focused uh, in, the, in the UAE um, and on, on these projects here, some of which you may have heard of. So uh, most recently, um, the Expo 2020 being the biggest project so far uh, for me. Um, and in those 12 years, I've learned a lot and uh, achieved quite a lot with uh, making risk management work. And so that brings me to, to the title of, of this presentation. Um, so just a bit of background, the way I've written this is, is really for those that have some basics around risk management, but I, I would hope it'd be very uh, helpful to those who are finding it challenging to implement risk management within Middle Eastern companies. It actually took me more than five years to, to discover the secrets of success, I call it, um, but it is impossible to communicate all of that in just 20 minutes. So this is my quick guide to making risk management work in the Middle East. So the first thing you should always do in any organization is go back to basics. Always start at the beginning, sounds obvious, um, but defining what risk is and the difference between risks and issues I found is very critical. So in all the places I've worked in, all had a mixture of issues within their risk registers. Or there was an expectation that issues are managed through the risk management procedures. So that definition is very important. The other thing I, I learned was that the need for simple language, okay? This has to do with the region you're in and uh, some of the, 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 the decision makers, um, uh, and especially in government institutions, Arabic is the, 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 the language of, of, of uh, requirement. And so um, what I found was that I, I converted all our uh, learning in the IRM, I put that to one side for a minute, and I just kept it very simple. Risks are problems waiting to happen. That worked very well in the organizations I went with. And issues are problems happening now. Now, for those of you that understand the risk management procedures, will say, well, risks are only bad. Well, really? Well, no, they're not. We know that as a risk profession. But what we need to do, our first step, is to make sure we embed some good risk practices. And focusing on the negative initially works well. And then as the risk maturity in the organization grows, you introduce things like opportunity management. And the other thing that I found and learned the hard way um, when I first landed in the Middle East as a Western consultancy is really you have to check the Western mentality at the airport. What do I mean by that? Well, having, having a, did a lot, done a lot of work in the UK around risk management, um, we used analogies like gambling and predicting the future. But the cultural norms out here in the Middle East, especially with the Islamic faith, these are all wrong. You cannot be... Uh, promoting these sort of activities. I know it sounds sounds little, but it actually is important to try and get the attention of the audience. It's, it's not to turn them off, it's, it's to keep them engaged. Uh, and the other thing that I learned was cultures are different. So focusing on cultures is a real important part of risk management because we want to institute a risk culture. But how do we do that? 
Now, one of the tools that I, I discovered along the way was, was this tool called Gert from uh, Gert Hofstetter. This is the six dimensions of cultural uh, uh, um, assessments for different countries. And uh, I won't go into into much detail, but what they do in, in the uh, analysis of countries in terms of its society, its governments, is they give them points between 0 to 100. Now, the website is there. So at the bottom there, you'll see the website, very useful. You can click, on, click onto that website and select whichever country of the world. And uh, I've selected for this presentation, India, United Arab Emirates, where I was working, United Kingdom, the United States. And on the bottom, you can see these six dimensions. So when we look at, say, the power distance here, you can see that the United Arab Emirates, which is the results are very similar for KSA, for Bahrain, um, it's very high in terms of the power distance. So that's the distance between the decision makers and, and, and perhaps the workers. So in the UAE and in the Middle East, what I find is you have a very different approach from a hierarchical structure to where I was uh, you know, born and raised, and that's in the UK, which is egalitarian. So egalitarian is everyone matters, you know, everyone has equal rights. Whereas in a hierarchical society, uh, people accept that their leaders are, are, are the ones that, that give them that guidance and, and, and uh, direction. So in an organization in the Middle East, you will see these sort of trends. Um, and what I did was I actually conducted a power distance survey in all the organizations I worked in. And what I found was very interesting, and I'll come to that uh, in a second. And I can't avoid what's down there, which is uncertainty avoidance. So what is uncertainty avoidance? So the study looks at the way society deals with the future, which can never be known. So Middle Eastern countries have a preference, as you can see, it's 80 points there, to avoid uncertainty. So you'd think that means that they'll be doing risk management. But actually, what I found was the opposite. What I found was that the leaders in the organization were unhappy when individuals in the organization started to communicate risks in, in, in their particular projects or, or their areas of responsibility. And that was always dealt with quite seriously by the leadership. They got very upset by that. And what that created in the organizations was a culture of hiding risk. And that's something that I had to tackle as, as the risk manager in the organizations. So what strategies can you use as a new risk manager in the Middle East? So what you will find are these things. So decisions will be made only by the CEO. The executives will focus on disasters, so natural calamities and insurance. That's our risk management program, surely. Internal audit is also very powerful here. And when you try to introduce risk management into an organization, it will belong to internal audit. So when we apply our risk knowledge and the, the Institute risk management practices, we'll say, no, well, actually, risk management is a separate independent function. If you start with that, you will fail. As I learned when I first tried to launch risk management uh, back in 2008. So what should you do? Well, for the, for the executives, keep it simple set those appetites and yes use heat maps very basic heat maps and thresholds don't try and take them down a route of uh risk appetite statements and, and and linkages which is what we do read but you have to take them on a journey to get to that point executives give them what they want show them that the company is exposed and protected from these disasters these external factors and once you have that trust you can start introducing inward and internal risk factors yes you might be assigned to to work under the internal audit manager support them produce more insightful risk uh, ideas and thoughts around um, other areas of the business so you're not just focusing on those controls okay but also look at the institute of internal auditors the iia look at their materials and share that with your, your fellow colleagues in the internal audit and it will demonstrate from a third party perspective uh, and a respected body that risks do need to be an independent uh, function from um, internal audit and that's what i found in my roles and i got moved in and created my own department and i'll share i'll share with you uh, the evolution there 
So what is the perception in, in the Middle East around the risk manager? Okay, so on the Western perception, this is what we see and recognize, the independence. You'll see roles like risk directors, chief risk officers, typically in, in, in the financial industry, but in the non-finance side, you, you'll, you'll get those directors. Driving risk culture. Who drives cultures in organizations? That's your top leadership. So risk managers are seen as part of the top leadership uh, group. Uh, we facilitate decision making and we're seen as a valuable resource and we have access to all areas. So that's the Western perception and that's what I was used to before I came to the Middle East because sadly this is what you will find when you join Middle Eastern organizations with a very low risk maturity. So your independence is gone, you're part of an internal audit. Uh, there's a belief that this risk manager, anyone can do it. You can get a fresh graduate and they can do it. It's an administrative role. And all they need to do is drive a spreadsheet. You're not driving culture, you're driving spreadsheets. And facilitating decision-making, well, no, what you're doing is you're just running a meeting, you're just facilitating a meeting. And actually, you as a risk manager are an overhead. So why, why are you here? So you're gonna have to continually justify your existence. And if there are no disasters happening in your organization, they'll say, well, we don't need the risk management team. Why, why, why do we need them? Uh, and the other thing that I struggled with very early on in my um, career in the Middle East was access to all, all areas. It just was not happening. And after a few uh, different strategies, I was able to get that access. So as a new starter, you'll start on that right-hand side of the list. Don't worry about that because in all the organizations I worked in, within a few years, I moved to the left-hand side of that screen where I became the independent. I was promoted into a more uh, uh, important you know, role where I had access to all areas, uh, given the director title to give me uh, that authority to, to challenge and question uh, anyone in the organization uh, and reporting into the CEO. So those are all things that came with time. So what is the secret to my Middle Eastern success? Well, this is the thing that I did and I discovered in my first five years and I have applied it to every organization since and it's dual clock speeds. Now I can't cover everything but I'll give you a flavor of what that looks like. So I took the executives on a slow clock speed and I took the project teams, you know the subordinates further down, on a fast clock speed. So with the executives I started off with the top-down approach of risk appetite statements, risk policies, frameworks, and procedures. Um, those procedures were then developed, uh, and then we had dashboards, top risks were then communicated to the executives, uh, and then there we, we engaged in discussions around the difference between corporate risks and project risks. And then that led on to other developments, such as introducing risk management throughout the entire project life, life cycle from the concept stage all the way through to operations and asset disposal. Um, and that's something which uh, became very successful in all the organizations that I worked in. This is where risk management became integrated in all the business activities of the company. That then enabled us to talk about enterprise risk management and looking at managing risks across the entire organization. We then introduced ERM software um, with a very enterprise focus at executives level, so that what would they see? How would they in, 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 you know, look at the support services? How do they input into risk information? And then we started engaging in discussions around centralized versus decentralized risk teams. Um, so whether you have a centralized large department of risk specialists like a bank would do, or whether, and what I found in the construction industry is you have a very small lean centralized team, a hybrid approach with a decentralized uh, management structure where individuals or risk champions uh, uh, manage risk procedures um, during that stage. On the right hand side we've got the projects. So what I did with them is just roll it all out. Okay, Project thresholds for cost, time, quality, health and safety. Generic, a generic risk management plan for all projects but each project member would then tailor elements to be project specific such as thresholds. Risk owners, define those, what their uh, roles were. I started a program of risk workshops and training uh, and rolling that out to the project teams, integrating their information 
uh, with risk reporting. So the risk reports, I didn't create a new risk report. I looked at all the reports that were being produced currently by the project teams and inserting risk information. Uh, and also with risk review, excuse me, risk reviews, um, making sure that the regular progress meetings that were happening on sites were including a risk section or a risk agenda item. We then started introducing quantitative uh, risk analysis, Monte Carlo simulations, um, and uh, the projects that I've worked on, uh, I believe are very rare to have such uh, advanced risk analytics being used in day-to-day in -day project delivery. Uh, and then we, we talked about ERM software, and that was a project focus. So as risk professionals, this is what we're taught, top-down approach. You have to get the tone from the top. I agree with that, absolutely. But if you wait for all of that before implementing on your projects, you're looking at five years. Five years to transform an organization from a starting point to everything on the right-hand side for, to implement those projects. I can't wait. We cannot wait for that to happen. So what I actually did is I implemented all of that on the right-hand side within the first year of every organization I've worked with without telling the executives. That's risky in its own right, but the little red line you might see there, that creates friction. That creates friction between the organizations because how do the project directors talk to the executives about risks where the executives don't understand the Monte Carlo or haven't been informed about these Monte Carlo analysis, for example. So how do you alleviate that friction? Well, this is where you insert the risk manager. So that's our role. We are there to be the bridge between the project teams and the executives in the Middle East. This is the, the, the recipe for success. So what is the secret of uh, Middle Eastern success? Okay, I say it's me, but it's, it's actually us. It's us as risk professionals. We have the ability to make these changes. Now, um, what, can, what can you do with this? How can you take this forward? So I just conclude with these eight things that I think you should do when implementing risk management in the Middle East. Always cover the basics. So start with the basics and go for continuous learning, not only for the organization, but for yourself. And one of the things that I picked up back in the UK days was Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I just implement that all the time. It's a real habit for me. So I think all risk managers should exhibit those seven habits. So if you haven't got that book, get it, read it, and live it. The other thing, obviously, you can do as a fellow of the Institute Risk Management, I would desperately ask you, listen, this is what you need to be doing. Join the IRM. The IRM will give you access to information. The learning that I achieved through the diploma, the understanding made me a better risk professional so that when I was talking to executives, I could talk their language. And when I was talking to the project teams, I can talk their language. So we need to have an ability to talk at all different levels of the organization. Get the executive level support for dual clock speed, all right? I took a risk, but what I would recommend is that you would get that sponsorship, that tone from the top, but get an executive sponsor to allow you or give you the authority to do those dual clock speed approaches in those organizations. Quick wins are very important. Regular project risk workshops and executive dashboards. Deal with those two sides of the spectrum. If that's what you do in the first three months of your new job, you'll keep, uh, I'm sure you'd pass your probation. Uh, people like that. The executives want their dashboards and the project teams will hopefully see the value that they get by attending your workshops. Continual development of your risk program and yourself. Always look to continue to develop your program, continuous learning and IRM will help you get there. Speaking of help, get help. So you cannot do this by yourself. The role will keep growing and growing and growing. And so I was able to uh, uh, luckily get a, a manager to support me with the workshops. Uh, then we moved into QRA. I needed a, an analyst to start gathering data, building those uh, models um, and facilitating the analytical work. Or you can outsource. So lots of consultants out there, bring in a consultant to help you deliver some of these um, um, uh, items. Do get promoted, okay? So that's important for, for, for everyone in, in their growth, but hopefully within your organization, do that. And finally, 
remember this one step at a time and you can't eat the whole elephant these are two expressions that i live by but obviously in the middle east let's uh, just tailor that you can't eat the whole camel so that concludes my presentation thank you very much for listening uh, my name's aj and do reach out to me on linkedin uh, and i'd be happy to answer any further questions thank you excellent aj Montaz ahoy Montaz. excellent so um so don't forget um any questions we've had some questions coming through already just drop them through to me via chat or the question functionality and i will group them together towards the end so on that note i will try to make mike um a presenter so mike if you accent i can see your screen so i'll wait until i can see the slides mike and then and while we're doing that, a quick comms check, Mike, if you can say something. Yeah, I'm I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Yes, loud and clear, loud and clear. So, so am I? What am I sharing? What can you see, Darren? I think I think we're seeing the previews. So if you switch the screens, um, and then. How do I switch the screens? I think it's display settings at the top, at the top display settings, and I think you can uh, switch, swap presenter view. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. That's it, Mike. I will drop off and over to you. Okay. Uh, did did it? Uh, I don't know if anybody saw. It. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Robertson, and I'm delighted to to be the next presenter in this this webinar uh, for the regional group of the kingdoms of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. And I've got to follow up with an excellent presentation from AJ there. Uh, lots of food for thought. Um, I hope that that stimulated lots of questions from the team, and I hope to to be able to do something similar. So. As Darren said, one of the key objectives of the group is to is to share uh, information and, and share knowledge, experience, and 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 there's been a recent uh, publication which I'm going to introduce as part of my presentation from the the UK Institute of Project uh, Institute of, of uh, sorry the the uh, I've forgotten the name of it. It's the major. It's the Infrastructure and Projects Authority. Sorry, and and as a good document they've produced, which I, I've stolen a lot of the ideas from, and I'm going to present that uh, today. So just quick, very quickly, who am I? Uh, I I started my career in the nuclear industry. I'm a physicist by trade. I moved into the risk management field. Been practicing practicing in risk management in lots of different sectors, particularly infrastructure, uh, for the last 35 years. Uh, I'm, I'm, all, I'm a certified fellow of the Institute of Risk Management. Currently, I'm Director of Professional Excellence in the Ministry of Finance Project Management Office. Uh, so I work for Khatib and Alami, which is a Lebanese engineering consultancy, and is part of the PMO. We're, we're the uh, project management organization for the uh, Holy Mosque expansions at Mecca, Medina, and a, a suite of, of projects that, uh, at Riyadh that uh, are under the remit of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, prior to joining Khatib Alami last year, I was uh, uh, worked for Bechtel, uh, and particularly on the Mashroat uh, Initiative, the National Project Management uh, Operations and Maintenance Organisation, which is now the uh, it's now the Spend Efficiency General uh, Government Projects Authority. Uh, so it's been merged with part of the Ministry of Finance. But it, it, when I worked with Bechtel, I was uh, Originally the risk manager, uh, and I, I also took on direct professional excellence responsibilities uh, while I was there. But uh, the key, the key point there is that there's a thing uh, major deliverable from Mashroat was the what they call the projects major the infrastructure projects white book, uh, which helps entities to deliver government infrastructure projects. And I was the author of volume 30, which is the risk management volume in that book. Right after that, I was managing director of a consultancy in the UK for 16 years. Uh, we worked in all sorts of different uh, sectors, particularly capital uh, expenditures uh, departments within the UK government. I have been a non-exec director on the UK Major Projects Association for 
uh, eight years now and, and continue to do so. So that's that's me. Uh, what am I going to talk about today? So it's 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 how is risk and uncertainty? What role does risk and uncertainty have when we're trying to develop project costs? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about why that's important. I'll, I'll, I'll link it to the the overall infrastructure project life cycle, uh, and I'll t t start to give you a bit more uh, insight into why I think it's important. Uh, cost estimation is very important. Lots of people think so. I'm going to try to re-emphasize re and, and, and uh, reinforce that message. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the, the approaches to how you undertake cost estimation. In particular, it's important that cost, the methodologies that you pick for cost estimation are related to the scale project, scale of project, the complexity, uh, and in particular the project, the stage in the project life cycle. Uh, then I'll show, then I'll talk about how we actually incorporate risk uncertainty into a project cost estimation, and I'm going to illustrate all this through a, a worked example. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk through. Why is risk and uncertainty important uh, for cost estimation? Well, before I get into that specifically, I just want to step back a little bit. And, and those of you who've heard me present it, it, it before, this is a, a key message I always try to communicate. That, that, and it's related to why is risk management, what is the purpose of risk management? So I think nobody would dispute that good management involves taking good decisions. Uh, and nobody would argue with the fact that any management decision has got inherent risks and uncertainties. Okay, so so my hypothesis is that if you put a better handle on the risks and uncertainties, you're more likely than not to make a better quality decision. Okay, so so risk and uncertainty, understanding risk and uncertainty is critical to supporting better management decision making. Okay, that's my hypothesis. Uh, and in just a couple of quick points that risk assessment is part of the overall uh, risk discipline. It's all about identifying and understanding the specific risks and uncertainties that could impact on your decision. Risk management is what you do to try to maximize the chance of, 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 of delivering the, the optimal outputs from your decision. Okay, so that's a very simple, and, and anytime I give a presentation, this is something that I around risk, this is something I always emphasize. That the key point is that risk management is about in supporting management decision making. And, and, and around that, a couple of other definitions, that, as far as I'm concerned, and, and it was interesting that AJ touched on this as well, that I, I, I tend to define risk as anything that can threaten successful achievement of objectives. Now, I know that some of you who will be uh, exposed to PMI and such like you all, you'll all immediately be sending in messages about what about opportunity. Uh, well, I've got a whole different presentation on, on how opportunity is managed and used, or should I say disabused, uh, in, in the risk management area. And, and I can talk about it, that at length. But, but, but at the moment, I think, and, and I completely agree with AJ, that we need to be able to walk before we can run. And so if we can focus on getting the core, the key aspects of risk management, right fast, which is all about understanding what can compromise or threaten our objectives, and if we can manage them better, we'll be making huge inroads. Okay? And and and, it, and so that, that comes back to this point, which I keep reinforcing it. Risk management is about informing decisions. And and in my definition here is it it's about and making better informed decisions about uncertain futures. Now that those are those are my definitions and we've included them in the, the mash right. Uh, so, so what, why, why, why is risk and uncertainty important to consider? Well, it's, it's, it's particularly important right at the early time when you're developing a project at concept stage. Uh, when you're developing a business case uh, right at the very start of a project, you need to understand what are the benefits, what are the demand for this project, do we really understand whether the benefits can be realized, is the project feasible? Is it, is it, can, it be, can it be undertaken from an engineering technical perspective? And, and, and very importantly, is it affordable? Okay, so risk and uncertainty will impact in all those three aspects. 
as we, as we define the project in more detail, as it moves through from, a, from the outline concept through to a more def, defined pre-design, outline design, you put it out to tender, all that stuff, as, as the project concept itself matures, then you should be refining and in, 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 in zero, zero, zooming in on the, the actual cost estimates so that the project cost estimates become more robust and the uncertainties become lower. Okay, and, and, and if you're doing that well, you should be linking that tightly to your scope and schedule. Uh, because if you can, if you've got a well-defined project with reasonably good cost estimates and an understanding of the, the, the scope of the project and how long it's going to take, you're more, more likely to be making better decisions about which projects we should be progressing. Okay, so cost uncertainty and, and, and the cost of the risks should be an important part of this initial consideration process because if, if you understand them better then you can understand whether there's a there's a potential for your project to become unaffordable and, and and if it is affordable how do we assign the appropriate level of risk contingency for our project so so that's ultimately where the the risk and uncertainty will help support a management decision it's about is this project too risky to, to actually progress, or if it's if we've decided we want to progress it, how should we assess what the risk contingencies should be? Okay. So how does that relate to the overall project life cycle? Well, this is a a, a typical design bid build project life cycle where we have the we've got the the definition of the project at the front end. We might do some front end engineering design. Uh, we tender for the design, we, we, we take it out uh, to the market and we get a full design back, which is then forms the basis for a tender to construct the works. We actually construct it, test commission, we hand it over to the end user. That's the typical project life cycle for a design bid build uh, project. I know that in the kingdom, we do a lot of design build projects and, and we have a, a similar life cycle uh, with different stage gates that we apply to that. But, but for this, project life cycle, if we consider uncertainty, you, what I'm trying to say is just a pure schematic, and I'm not, there's no scales attached to this, so don't overinterpret this too much. But basically, in the early days, we have we have some uncertainty around the business case. Is, it, is, it, is the project feasible? We might decide it is, in which case the uncertainty becomes uh, lower. As we put it out to design, the actual methodology, some of the design solutions, uh, the, the construction, constructability, all those techniques will be addressed during the design and so the, the uncertainty becomes lower as well and over time the uncertainty drops to zero. In contrast, however, the risk for the projects typically will increase, particularly as we go into the construction because construction we know from experience is when it's, that's when the projects tend to go wrong. The schedule runs out, the costs start to rise, the, the, we get into problems. So we know that from experience that, that the, whilst the uncertainty around the project may have reduced, risks can increase, okay? So, so my, what I'm trying to communicate here is we need to understand both of these dimensions to, to, to get a better handle on managing the, the project costs. So cost estimation. Now, a lot of what you're gonna see me present here now has been taken from this document, which I thoroughly recommend. It was just published about a month ago or two, two months ago. Uh, this is from the infrastructure, the UK Infrastructure and Projects Authority. And this is freely available on the website. You can see the, the reference here. The Infrastructure and Projects Authority is essentially a government body whose remit is essentially to help government departments deliver projects smarter. Okay, and, and that's not just the the, the, the methods for delivering projects, but developing the people who will be managing those projects and being more consistent in terms of the, the tools and techniques that they use to report uh, project progress across government departments. So there, there's, there, there's lots of guidance they produce that I would really recommend you have a look at. But this is, I'm, I'm taking some of the ideas from this document. So what does this document reinforce? It's just a definition of cost estimating. That's just about you know what is cost estimating. It's about understanding the resources that you're going to need to complete a project to time and cost, okay, uh, and within a defined scope. We know from experience 
that the more you invest in understanding or, or defining your project up front, then the more you invest at that stage, then the, the easier it is to deliver benefits downstream. If you try to change the scope of a project or there are residual uncertainties around a project at the start, we know from experience that things can go badly. Uh, and, and, and so the, the key message here is that starting a project well is critically important and, and having an accurate and reliable project cost estimate right at the start will support the project going forward because it will support starting the project well at the beginning. Okay, so this is in, in this document it talks about the, the key, key things about principles of cost estimating, the importance of people, the skills, competencies that those people need to have and, and the processes and, and, and uh, procedures that you need to use, the tools, methods you need to use in order to to perform effectively. So the, the document itself covers principles, people, and, and performance, and, and, and the, the, the eight key steps in the cost estimating process are, are highlighted here. And there's more detail about each of these steps in the document itself. I just wanted to highlight uh, these, these, these two, two uh, steps in the process, because step four is where we start to introduce uh, assessment of the cost risk in the the uncertainty in the costs. And step eight is when you use all this information to help support a decision around the project going forward. So these are the two key bits that I'm trying to focus on today, linking the costs and risk uncertainty to management decision-making on, on projects. So again, from the document, it talks about the key principles and a couple of things that's worth highlighting here is having the right skills in your cost estimation department. Uh, again, we know I uh, hear all the time from clients, we were being screwed by the contractor because we didn't understand the potential costs effectively or, or well enough at the start of the project. So as you're, as you're putting a project out to market, if, if you've got a very weak understanding of how much that project's likely to cost you, then you very probably end up getting into trouble at some point downstream. And, and so having the right skills in your team to define and have a good understanding of the potential costs is really important. But, but, but the two things I wanted to highlight is, is uh, specifically these. So cost estimating, the, the method you use for cost estimates will depend on where you are in the project life cycle. And, and it will also depend on the complexity and scale of the project. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that your estimates for the costs need to reflect the potential risks and uncertainties associated with those costs. And, and if you don't do that, you, you'll end up potentially uh, not having a good understanding of, of your potential really and the, the real cost that you might, might, be, might incur as you go forward. So what would I mean by the different methodologies? So again, uh, as, as our project is, becomes more defined over time, and this is just uh, showing you the, the, the sort of project, uh, the life cycle of the, the business case development. This is what the UK Treasury, which is equivalent to the, the Minister of Finance here in Kingdom, is, is the definition in the business case is refined and costs become more understood, better understood. The scope of the project becomes better understood. The, 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 the uh, project execution plan, etc., all that sort of stuff becomes more well refined. Then your the methods and tools you might use to estimate the potential impact of risks on your project costs will change. And 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 this has shown us that uh, in, in the very early stages of a project definition, where there are high uncertainties, it doesn't really warrant a detailed, sophisticated probabilistic Monte Carlo type approach because the uncertainties themselves will drive the 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 the, the overall project cost uh, itself. So if you try to put an employer a, a, a detailed mathematical model earlier on, you'll probably be convincing yourself on in the basis of poor science and you'll be allowing the science to drive your thinking. 
as the, as, the, as the project becomes more defined, it might be more appropriate to apply uh, a mathematical model. Uh, and over time, eventually, you know you'll be as the project starts to complete, it goes through various phases, then you'll be able to introduce the actual costs so that you can understand what the impact going forward. So, so what is this trying to say is that the methodology you use should depend on where you are in the project life cycle, which I hope is self-evident. The type of approaches uh, that are approached, well, a deterministic approach very early on, uncertainties might be very high, but we may have similar projects you can point to. And, and those are the, the, the uh, we, we built a, a reprocessing platform, we built a refinery uh, over here the, uh, last year, and, and, and this is the outcome cost for that. So that might be a sort of input that goes into that. Probabilistic models are where you, you try to build up, our project is going to consist of these different cost elements. We, these costs will have risks and uncertainties associated with it. We can build up a sophisticated model that will give us a potential outcome in terms of the overall costs for our project. Well, that's, that, that is fine if you've got good data to support that, but it's very easy to be tempted uh, to, to take the, the outputs from these models as, 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 uh, as, as the gospel and, and, and not to actually challenge them appropriately. And, and that's, so beware, the, 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 to avoid being blinded by the science, just because as a sophisticated model being used, doesn't mean to say that the outputs of the model are particularly helpful or, or useful. Uh, the other approaches generally is, is top down and bottom up, and they, they are hopefully self explanatory. Top down, we look at the overall project, and bottom up is we, we build up individual cost elements underneath that. Okay. Uh, now, in terms of, of, of uh, other cost estimating methods uh, that are commonly used, we have uh, parametric cost estimating. So, for example, if we are talking about a hospital, it might, it, we have good data on how much it will cost for hospitals with 500 beds, 1,000 beds, 500 beds. So the, the parameters we might use are how, how many beds will this hospital have? For schools, how many pupils will this school have? For roads, what's the, what's the length of the road? How many carriageways are there on the road? Those are the parameters that you might use to support a parametric cost, cost estimating approach. Fast principles are, are much more sophisticated. It's where you've got good data uh, and you can break down your project into understood cost elements. Uh, analogy cost estimating, I touched on that. Well, we built a similar project over here a couple of years ago, and we can we can look at the outturn costs for that project, and we might be able to estimate our project costs on the basis of that. And if you've got no real idea, because there's no experience elsewhere, or it's a relatively novel project, then you're likely to have to rely on, on expert opinion. And that comes back then to the skills and competence of your cost estimating team. Uh, as far as the risk estimates are concerned, then it's there are different methods that can be applied. And I'm, I'm not going to go through these in detail today. Uh, I'd point you back to that to the reference document that I'm using to inform this presentation, and they provide a bit more background to, 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 to the, the risk cost estimating methods and what type of circumstances you might want to use one of these three approaches. Okay. So I'm trying to move forward. Anyway, so the if you want more information about these models, uh, that, uh, refer back to that guidance again. Okay, so what does that all mean in terms of interpretation or, or building it into a cost estimate? So the following schematic is absolutely true. That for any, any project cost estimate, we will have a base cost of which, and, and the base cost might be made up of different cost elements, labor, materials, equipment, uh, permissions, overheads, whatever it is, and each of those cost elements will have some uncertainties associated with it. Okay, and then top of that, there will be so there will be uncertainties associated with the individual costs, and then there will be events or things that could impact on our overall project cost estimates. 
and, and a combination of all those three things will give you an, an anticipated final cost. But in, but, in, but in addition to that, there will be a range around that because the anticipated final cost will be subject to, to uh, these uncertainties and risks that could feature in some of which may be realized, some of which will not. Uh, so so that, that is true for any project cost estimate. And I'm now going to go through an example uh, based, based on uh, something that we, I did at home to show how all these, these elements can be used and, and to inform your, your uh, project cost estimate and, and the impact on that on the project life cycle. Okay, so the, very quickly, this is a, uh, a we built an orangery at home. Orangery is a fancy name for a large conservatory. Okay, so what am I talking about? This is this is our this was the orangery we we used to. So this was the conservatory that we used to have. We wanted to to build something different. It was going to be bigger. Uh, it was going to require us to to dig down underneath here. This would have to be knocked down. Uh, we were going to knock through from our 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 our, our uh, dining room into this area. And and what you can barely see because the sun across here we've got the land eye, uh, which are are hedging. Uh, that, that have got particular regulations around foundation work that you're allowed to do by them, near them. Okay, are you are you chasing me up, Darren? I'll I'll try to to, to speed on. So this is the the uh, uh, orangery. Uh, this is the model that we I developed for Anna. So we're going to demolish the conservatory. We've got groundwork foundations. I'm going to break through from the the existing dining room. We're going to build the the, the new facility, and we would have put a roof on it, and then it all has to be wired in, in tile. So this is our original cost, the basic cost estimates for each of these elements, and I got a, a contractor in to give us a price around that. But any good cost estimator will tell you that there's going to be some range around that, okay? And that's what these maximum minimum costs are meant to be provided, and and they they provide you, and they are just a, a genuine uncertainty around the, the the cost elements okay this is meant to be a six month project and and, if, and on the basis of these uncertainties if without any probabilities or anything but you, we've got some of these items have got cost are skewed fairly highly so the wind the woodwork uh, it, it, you can see is it's going to be a minimum of 30 but it could be as high as 40 and what that means is that our expected cost Everything else being equal is going to be higher than the 100 base cost estimate. Okay, so that's the uncertainty element. This is the risks, and so for each of those elements, the, each of those those seven elements here, we've got specific risks that identified. That ranges from uh, you, un underground utilities, the woodwork, the 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 the, 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 the woodwork that we are building in a manufacturing facility off-site had to be built on top of the brickwork. All these risks have been identified, and these are the cost estimates of those risks with uh, the, the, the best estimate for the cost if the risk is realized, minimum, maximum, and then a probability of, of the risk being realized. Okay, so that's, that's the risk aspect. And the expected risk is here, it's just the mean value. And this, this actually gets us into a, a situation where what is the right value for the risk contingency, okay? Because if you're doing a Monte Carlo type analysis, you would typically do some analysis around this. And 10.1 here is the mean value, which is going to be fine in this case because our overall risks are pretty distributed relatively uniformly. But if this distribution was highly skewed and there was some long tail risks, then you'd have to take a different view on whether a mean value or a higher value you would need to be employed. Okay, but anyway, that's that's what I used here. And and if you if you step my model forward in time, and I can I did this month on month, month one, month two, month three, right through to month six. So what I'm showing here is that these were the actual costs incurred for these activities. So there's no more risks associated with those activities. This is the outturn cost, which is a combination of the uncertainty in the cost itself and some of these risks being realized. So, for example, we had to do more, more work on the foundation work 
as a result of the the, uh, the the work that we found underneath the conservatory. And and when you can build up, this this can be used over time. And if I then plot all this information from the start, this was our this was my baseline picture. I had a budget of 100k. The risks we reckon could were about 10.1k, and the uncertainty aspects was about 8.3. So key as you go through in time, this is showing you how the the risk, the cost risk, and the the uncertainty in the cost reduces over time. Okay, so that in the end, my outturn cost was 114k. And what I'm showing here is that in this case, with the uncertainty, taking the uncertainty on board and looking at the risk, using the mean value of the risk costs of 10.1 was, was, was appropriate because the final outturn cost means I was still within that envelope. Okay. But but if I had ignored the uncertainty in the cost and just focused on the risk costs then my outturn cost would have been higher than my budget and, and I could have been in trouble. Okay, so, so that's just a very simplistic example. And of course, you all want to know what it looked like. So this is the, the project. We knocked down the conservatory. That's the groundwork starting. We found utilities that didn't expect down there. Water outlines, that's the starting to do the foundation, build up the framework and putting the roof on. And what does it look like? We're delighted. That's what it looks like in the end. And, and we're very happy with it. Uh, at the end of the design. So, so what it, my main conclusions, I'll wrap it up, Darren, this is it. I said it at the start, I said it several times, why do we do risk management? It's to support decision making. And, and for projects, for projects, it's critical that we start any project well at the beginning. And, and, and for, for cost estimation, if you've got a robust cost estimate as early as possible, which has been informed by the risk and uncertainty, then you're going to increase your, increase your chance of starting well. Okay. The best approach to cost estimation will depend on where you are in the project life cycle and the scope and, and uncertainty. But beware overconfidence in sophisticated mathematical and, and probability based methods. They're, they've got a tool, they've got a role, they've got a place, but if they are heavily reliant on data that itself might be subject to large uncertainties. But nevertheless, if you understand your cost uncertainties and your risk costs, then, then you, you, and you, you must use both. You, could, you shouldn't use just one or the other. If you, use, if you understand your uncertainties in the costs and the risk costs, then you should be in a good position to develop and monitor your project costs over time. That's it. And um, apologies, Darren, I I think that was about 25. It's okay. Math theme, math theme or scale, oh, no problem. Mike. Cool. So if I take the ball back, AJ, if you want to um, switch your uh, camera on. So... No, we've still got 23 people, so. In, um, but the numbers so the, uh, yeah, so, um, so they're both on LinkedIn. Feel free to contact them directly, either if we don't, uh, if I don't ask the question properly, or if you have any follow on queries or if your answers, uh, questions aren't asked. So there, there are three sort of questions. I'll, I'll go through them first and then I'll. I'll hand over to AJ and Mike to go through one at a time. Um, we're really lucky where we're AJ and Mike have a lot of experience of embedding risk management within organizations. And the first one is probably give us some hints and tips when we are engaged. As AJ spoke about, sort of we have to engage lots of stakeholders, top to bottom, left to right in an organization. So maybe some useful hints and tips when it comes to engaging stakeholders uh, uh, when it comes to embedding risk management. So that's the first question. The second question is, particularly in the kingdom here, there are a lot of projects, new projects, things starting up, and we may find ourselves in a situation where we're starting from scratch. And and I suppose that my next, the next question has come from 
from, from the attendees is what would be some useful places to start? Where are those one or two or three areas just to start off on when it comes to um, implementing risk management from scratch on something new? It could be a new project, a new business unit, a new department, something new. And then thirdly, and, and, and uh, Mike's presentation is quite good, a useful source of information. A third question is, right, are there any useful websites, uh, so databases, sources of information where we find ourselves coming back to, to, to help as well? So, so three questions. So first question, uh, hints and tips on engaging stakeholders. And I'll hand over to AJ first to say a few words on that. Okay. Uh very good. In terms of engaging stakeholders, so from a risk management perspective, who are your stakeholders? And it's the basically the entire organization. So where do you start? And I would say your primary stakeholder would be your boss. Um, you want to make sure that uh, they're aware of um, uh, um, the, the things that you're planning to do. Um, but in terms of engagement, I would look at um, the organization as a pyramid and you've got your executives you've got your middle management and then you've got uh, uh kind of the operators uh, and, and uh, the rest of the company and then you've got obviously your uh, stakeholders uh, other stakeholders would be suppliers and things like that so the engagement will have to be tailored uh for each and um it is very much a top-down approach to make sure that as a risk professional in the organization that you focus on the executives and um, the regular engagement in terms of uh, um, how frequent you meet with them will be guided by the risk appetite within the organization so if you're in a high risk business like construction there has to be regular engagements with those stakeholders um, the other thing i would advise is to just look up some stakeholder mapping tools. There's a lot out there, but there's one that I uh, very very popular that I use all the time, uh, and that's a full, you know, uh, basically a grid where you look at uh, um, the stakeholder uh, interest in risk management and then the stakeholder's influence on on your ability to deliver. So you look at those two dimensions for all your stakeholders, and it puts you in a particular quadrant. And uh, anyway, there's lots of stuff around stakeholder management in that particular regard. So do look that up. Excellent. Thanks. Good. Good advice, AJ. Mike, over to yourself. If any any other hints and tips. So, so uh, I completely support what AJ said in terms of there's lots of stakeholder management tools and processes, power influence matrices, and things to help you uh, in, to help inform which stakeholders you should prioritise your your efforts with. But but from my perspective, the the whoever your stakeholder is, wherever they sit in the organisation whether it's internal, senior, junior, external or not, the first thing you should do is understand their pains. Okay, so, so when you speak to them, understand what their particular challenges, issues, problems are, because they will be in a particular organization and they'll have particular pressures on them that have got specific outcomes or deliverables that they are trying to achieve. And their failure to deliver those outcomes are where you need to get that's the sweet point that you need to try to hit because coming back to my premise that all all that risk management is about is helping inform better management decision making so if you can identify the pain that an individual has got then you can start to relate that pain to particular risks issues that you can help them provide a framework or a, or a language that you can communicate with them that, about that shows how risk can actually help them alleviate their pains. And that, that would be my, my counsel around uh, how you start with stakeholders. That's a great question because it, it resonates with uh, AJ's point where good engagement turns the me into we. So uh, uh, you can borrow that one. Um, the next question then is around implementing risk management, in particular where we're starting from scratch. Let's assume there's nothing there. You're walking in, uh, there's nothing in place, as I said, new project, new department, new business unit, whatever it is, where do you start? And, and maybe if you can offer up maybe a couple of, uh, a little bit of advice on that. And this time I'll go Mike first and then AJ. 
Okay, well, you start at the beginning, <laughs> and 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 they, they, that sounds easy, but all the all the standards, uh, thirty one thousand ISO thirty one thousand and one, will tell you that the first thing you do on any risk management process is, is clarify what the objectives of the enterprise, the organisation, the project, the department, whatever it is that you are working with, what are their objectives? Okay, so what does what are they trying to achieve and what does success mean for them? Okay. Once you've defined that, once you've got a clear and common understanding of that, then you can start to think, right, well, what are the things, events, external pressures, internal resource problems that could start to compromise successful delivery of those objectives? Because that's if you get that started, if you get that ball rolling, then you've started to put in place. The, the, the foundation work for a risk management process going forward. Excellent, Mike. Uh, AJ, anything else to add? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd echo what uh, Mike said about the objectives. It's, it's vitally important. So the ISO talks about risk being defined as uh, the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So uh, what I roll out in my training programs internally is if you have no objectives, you have no risks. Simple as that. Or if somebody gives me a risk and they are unable to link it to an objective, it's not a risk. Okay, so objectives are central to all of that. But um, starting from scratch, uh, I, I had the, uh, the fortuitous opportunity to do that. And I think in the Middle East, uh, you will find a lot of companies, a lot of people out there listening in have that challenge. Where do you start? Risk management is, is, is the big elephant that you've got to consume. So here's, here's what I do. I would say the first thing you do is, um, have a current state assessment. So basically what you're doing is gathering information. So the first thing you do in your day one of the organization is say, okay boss, what's out there? And you find what's out there, you look at existing reports, uh, how they deal with contingency, what the executives know or don't know about risk management. Uh, is there a policy? You have to understand the organization. Step one is, is information gathering. Um, understanding the current state. Step two is then you will be dis looked upon to provide the vision of the future state. So what does good risk management look like? And that's your learning. That's what you need to learn. But what does basic risk management look like would be, I'd say, you're, sadly, your starting point in the Middle East. So what do you want to, what would it look like in 12 months time? So point two is to say, what does, what does it look like I've been here for 12 months, what does that look like? So you need to be able to describe that, understand it, picture it in your mind. Step three is then build that roadmap. So within, I would say, the first month of your engagement, you need to have produced a roadmap which shows a 12-month view of the big items that you're going to achieve the key milestones on a month-by-month -month basis, and then, you have a detailed six-month deployment plan, and this is this is this has been my recipe in all the organisations I've worked in. So that six-month deployment plan then becomes a rolling program. So after the first quarter, you then look forward again the next six months, bring the details for the three months, and then you have another six-month detailed plan. When you get to the end of the year, you're refreshing your plan, your thoughts. Um, so those would be, uh, I would say, your starters. Um, the other thing that I would say in terms of my presentation, the quick wins, have that executive dashboard. So from the information you've gathered, you can build a risk dashboard straight away for the executives. And I've done that before. The information may not be great, uh, but at least it's a start. And then the other thing I do is I start running risk workshops. So I give people a risk register at project level. Uh, but I will also take the opportunity to, um, to remind all our risk people, I'm going to there's a phrase that I haven't quite patented yet, but I'm taking from the economic uh, uh, um, phrase, uh, which you may recognize. Um, risk registers are vanity. Risk contingencies are sanity, but context is king, all right? So you will have organizations that say, yeah, we've got risk registers. But that's just vanity, that's just vain. It doesn't actually need anything. What's sanity and what's saying is, is having that contingency. How do you deal with costs? How do you deal with time overruns? How do you deal uh, with your plan B? 
But what is king in risk management is context, and that's what is the risk, you know, what is the risk areas? Why are we looking at this particular risk? So is it a corporate risk? Is it a delivery risk? Is it an external risk? Is it a financial risk? Um, and it all has to relate to your objectives. So make sure you have those three areas in your mind when you start from scratch. Excellent. Thanks, thanks, AJ. And then we're on to the last question. We, today we've had a lot of useful references and, and the third question is around sort of uh, just reflecting back. Are there any good websites that people sort of or people should search for? Um, and, and at the same time, when you're answering your question, maybe if there are any final points that you wanted just to reinforce from your presentation. So this time I'll go with AJ first. Okay, on websites, uh, there is a lot of information and I, I will start with the IRM um, and, you know, just coming prior to coming to this uh, webinar to get thoughts on, on, on my presentation, I did go into the IRM website and there are a lot of webinars and videos on there that you can download. Very well structured, laid, uh, laid out so you can look at various uh, areas of risk management to get some, some, some knowledge. Um, ISO 31000 is a search that you should look at. Uh, ISO 31000 2018 um, has, has been updated. It's a very good starting point. Uh, you won't get the full document, you have to buy that, but there's a lot of material written around that. Um, but I think what we could do is I've, I've got some hyperlinks uh, to, to lots of risk useful stuff that I've gathered over the years and, and I, I share that with my teams. So um, um, Darren, perhaps if there's a way we can uh, perhaps populate a list of useful links. Um, and so final thoughts on, on, on my context, a uh, quick guide to making risk management work in the Middle East. Um, the, the challenge that risk professionals will have is that the risk profession is not considered a top management function, it's considered an administrative function. So you'll be pushing against that uh, all the time. Um, but hopefully I've given you some strategies on how you can introduce that, change that mindset. Um, and uh, the work that I did um, in, in one particular Abu Dhabi government entity was held up as uh, what great looks like. And other government entities came in, uh, looked at what we did, and, and they are now replicating that. So what's a testimony to, to, to the good work is that now, even that I've left those organizations for many years ago, I still talk to those companies and 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 they're still implementing the risk management work that I've did and, and they're developing it further. So um, good luck to everyone out there who's implementing risk management and it can be done, um, but it does need you to focus and keep um, that uh, movement uh, going. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Edge. And Mike, again, just on sources of information and if there were any reflecting on your presentation, any points you wanted to highlight again. So, in terms of sources of information, I, I, I'm from the UK as well. I think all three of us are, uh, and, and, and so my my views on that are very UK centric. But I would really uh, advocate if you're looking for free documents that you can read, download, then the UK government departments, uh, the Infrastructure Projects Authority, uh, the HM Treasury in the UK. They have fantastic uh, documents on, on risk management generally across government departments and the IPA particularly for, for projects. Uh, the, the other UK uh, government entity department that I recommend that you look at, which is it's very uh, health and safety orientated though, is the UK Health and Safety Executive. Uh, these are the regulator uh, that, that, offer, that manages health and safety in all industries uh, in, that employ people in the UK. Uh, whilst it's health and safety orientated, a lot of the risk management frameworks, thinking, uh, some of it em emerged from, from the health and safety uh, area. So for example, we all, you've heard of risk appetites, tolerability of risk, tolerability of risk was originally uh, it came from the nuclear industry and, and it was then adopted by the health and safety regulators for, a, for application to, to other, other sectors in the, the whole concept of, of managing risks to as low as reasonably practical. That, that came out of the health and safety uh, sector. So uh, there's lots of free documents uh, in there. Uh, uh, one, if you want to write it down, 
would be uh, reducing risks, protecting people, uh, R2P2. Uh, it, it was a, it's a key document about risk management frameworks that the HSE made publicly available. In fact, Darren and I worked on some of the work for the rail industry and how they actually uh, use that. So, so that, that, that's very good. The other, other, other source I'd point you to are, are the big four pro, uh, management consultants, the, the KPMGs, Deloitte, PwC, EY, and McKinsey as well. Uh, they, they often produce surveys, they often produce uh, sector-specific reports, and, and they will have a they, they produce discipline specific reports and risk management is, all, is an area that, that all four of them offer offer uh, documentation they're obviously trying to sell their services in this area but some of the documents that they come up with are, are extremely interesting and provide some good background information uh, I said at the start I'm a I'm a non-exec director in the major projects association uh, that's actually a members only it, uh, it's an organizational members only uh, uh, association but we produce lots of uh, one two page flyers of our seminars that are a synthesis of the conferences that, that we run in lots of key areas and this is in the major projects area but it's not just infrastructure it could be IT it could be uh, policy development uh, uh, telecoms work uh, pension pensions distribution that has all sorts of stuff uh, and, and, and those things are available uh, it's it's www.mpa.org and, and if you go on there you'll find lots of, of free information around that. Uh, I think most of the people in the Middle East are completely familiar with the Project Management Institute uh, from the US uh, and, and, and there you have to pay to, to become a registered risk management professional or project management professional, whatever it is. Uh, the UK equivalent to that is the Association of Project Management, and they also produce some free flyers and documents and, and, and that, that, that are available uh, to look at. Uh, AJ's said the, the IRM uh, website. Uh, I, I, the, the thing that I think would be particularly worth investing in it's the the webinar information from other regional groups or the special interest groups because the conferences and seminars that we've run in those other areas uh, they're free and you can get access to them uh, and, and and like we presented today uh, you you can get access to the, the presentations in, in other areas so those that was quite a big list uh, and those are all things that I tend to look at fairly regularly uh, in terms of reinforcing my my message uh, back to the, the, the core message that risk management, if, if the only purpose of risk management is to inform management decisions. Okay, And, and when it comes to projects, uh, starting a project really well is critical to the potential success of that project. It, there's lots of evidence that if you start a project badly, you will end badly. Uh, and one of the key elements in starting a project well is having a robust and a reasonably accurate understanding of the costs of that project, which must be informed by an understanding of the risks and the uncertainties in those costs. That's it. Excellent. Thanks again. So, so we're going to wrap up now. Um, I have three three points just to to close on. First of all, a uh, massive thank you. So, Ali, you take a laugh here. AJ, well, my, you know, uh, putting the effort in, put, giving up their time, making the presentation, offering up their insights as well. Uh, a big thank you uh, to Rory uh, back in London uh, and the IRM for helping with the administration of this. And all, all the attendees, we peaked at nearly 35 attendees. So, again, you know the, these webinars we will run them all the time but sort of it's great to see so even though there are webinars every week um and we're getting a little bit tired of them and uh, it's great to see the support we're getting from the risk community in the region um my second point is um some uh, i've been asked by a few people so if anyone's uh completing the irm certificate or diploma um and you need maybe to sort of link up with others in the in the region you're also studying, or maybe you need some support. We could run a special webinar if you have some technical queries. Get in touch with me. 
um, and I will try to sort of link people together in terms of small study groups across the various uh, modules. And then uh, thirdly, um, a certificate of attendance. Some of you have messaged me during the webinar. If you need one, just message me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email address, or sorry, my WhatsApp was were on the slides. So if you if you missed that when the recording comes out as well. And that's it. So the sun has the sun has gone down during our, our, our webinar. It's dark outside now. Time to go home. And thanks again everybody for your time and I will speak again soon. Thank you everybody. Ma salama. Thank you. Shukran.